this might look like a page of random letters. But to us virologists, this paints a vivid picture. So this is the genome of SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19. It is the blueprint of the enemy that we are facing and hides its secrets. So this portion highlighted in red identifies the key protein that the virus uses to infect human cells. This is its Achilles heel. Armed with this genetic information, we have the tools to fight back against the virus. We can start our quest for a vaccine. There's growing concern as the Wuhan pneumonia outbreak continues to spread. The US has confirmed its first case of the Wuhan virus. The CDC has raised the alert level from one to two. Japan says that it now has a case of a person contracting this coronavirus. Here in Singapore, two more cases have tested positive. We now have a name for the disease and it is COVID-19. My name is Wei Ying Yang. I'm a professor here at Duke and US Emerging Infectious Diseases Program. I'm the principal investigator here on the Singapore side, developing the vaccine. So this is where we do all the research on viruses. The team that was working on this vaccine uh, really people who have a very specialised set of skills. Ruki de Alwis is looking at antibodies and which part of the virus the antibodies target. Eugenia, she's measuring genes to look at whether the vaccine is safe. Shi Wei, Dr Chen, is trained in T-cell. So these are cells that get rid of the infected cells. And then Esther has developed a mouse model because we need to know that the vaccine will protect against infection. So these are the people that work in the team, uh, the vaccine team. Hello. How I found out I was going to be working on this vaccine is quite funny, actually. I think in March, um, Prof, we walked past our office and he just came in and tapped me on the shoulder and he went, I need you to get me some mice. And I looked at him for... <laughs> and then he said, the vaccine worked. And I said, OK. But at that point, I had no idea which vaccine we were talking about. I wasn't part of it in the beginning, so then someone asked me, oh, why don't you just ask Enyong? So I went to him and I said, you know, I really would like to be part of the COVID response. He said, oh, really? I got CC'd in on the emails, and then I realized this was really much bigger than what I initially thought it was. When I first came onto this, I didn't really know that I would be working on a project of such magnitude. When we first found out that we were going to be working on the vaccine, it had hit almost every single country worldwide. There was so much more of an impetus to really get the work going. This is the first pandemic caused by a coronavirus. We have rung the alarm bell loud and clear. With the outbreak emerging in January, a team was formed by the WHO uh, in collaboration with the Chinese authorities. I was one of uh, 12 uh, international representatives to go on that mission. When I arrived in Beijing, the country really had been brought to its knees. The streets were empty, there were no cars, very few people. As a result of what we saw in Beijing and elsewhere in China, we had fears that the world wasn't ready for this. The speed of the spread of this virus is really unprecedented. Within one to two months, almost every corner of the world reported to have the virus. We come back to the basic principle how brand new pathogens can cause a pandemic. SARS-CoV-2 has got some advantages which allow it to transmit very successfully. 
the virus is highly transmissible, infectious, and it spreads through direct contacts and respiratory droplets. The amount of virus in someone with COVID-19 is actually highest right at the beginning of the disease, even before the symptoms start. About 80% have very mild symptoms or no symptoms. You go around, you meet with people, you go to a shopping center, you go to restaurants, you share food, because you don't know that you have the infection. So this gives the virus a particular advantage in terms of spread. So the community spread is, is inevitable. This is a, a model of a SARS coronavirus 2 or SARS CoV-2, right? This looks like a crown that kings and queens wear. And so that's how it got its name, coronavirus. These spike proteins here, you can think of it like a key. And the virus uses this key to unlock the cell to get into the cell. And it binds to certain receptors that are on our cells in the lungs. And then it attaches, goes in, gets taken in. Your immune system is like an army. And what we want them to do is recognize this protein so that when the virus does get into you, these soldiers will recognize that and then they'll start to attack. How vaccines work is to produce antibodies and the antibodies will then bind to these spike proteins. And it'll block the spike proteins on the virus from binding to the receptor and going into cells which are in the lungs. Our body also makes a second thing and that's called killer cells. T cells are sometimes known as um, killer T cells because one of their roles is that they are able to recognize parts of the invading pathogen in infected cells and can kill these directly infected cells and thus stop the infection from progressing any further. The vaccines that trigger both the antibody as well as the T cells, they are the ones that you know, hopefully will produce the best form of immunity. Hi, Joe. How are you? Hey, great, Professor. How are you doing? I'm good. The vaccine we're developing is a partnership with Arcturus Therapeutics, which is based in San Diego. This is the team from Arcturus. This is uh, Joe Payne, from, the CEO of Arcturus, and uh, Nida, the uh, head of investor relations. They are a biotech company that essentially develops genetic material as a way of delivering drugs. We'll get the data to you soon. Yeah, that's great news. Uh, we also have some additional test articles that we're getting shipped and sending your way. This partnership was really brought about by the Economic Development Board, uh, EDB of Singapore, in January. EDB connected me with Arcturus Therapeutics, and that's how we started uh, the conversation. Bye for now. Thank you, Thanks. Guys. Bye. Okay. Yeah. This is it. This is where true innovation happened. We're very proud of the scientists here. This is where the vaccine was discovered. And I think that's important to know. Singapore approached us in February of 2020, and they evaluated our technologies. And it consummated in a deal that we would develop this vaccine together. And Singapore brought in the Duke NUS Medical School at that time, and we've been working on this vaccine ever since. The Arcturus vaccine candidate is a messenger RNA vaccine. We call the vaccine Lunar COV-19. Everybody knows what DNA is. You get it from your mom and your dad, but it's permanent. DNA gets converted to RNA. And then RNA makes stuff, makes proteins and enzymes. The vaccine that we're making is in the form of RNA. So the idea then is that if we inject this into people, then the RNA will make a lot more of these spikes. So it cannot make this virus, it only makes the spike. This is infectious, but this is not. Without the virus, your immune system learns that if they see this protein, they attack. So when you do get the infection, which is this entire virus over here, and they see these little spikes, which looks exactly like what we fed them before, your army comes out to attack. How we're different from Moderna and Pfizer vaccines is we use this STAR mRNA. It's called self-transcribing and replicating RNA, which means our dose level is lower than conventional messenger RNA vaccines. Our dose level is 7.5 micrograms. That's a very tiny dose. My thumb, it weighs around 10 grams. And 10 grams of messenger RNA is millions of doses. 
So you can see that entire room is just full of freezers storing different types of vaccines. There's unique challenges with working with any group that's distant. In here, we have refrigerators and freezers. It's really important that we store things properly. We are shipping important materials over borders, and that can present some challenges. If it's temperature-sensitive materials, we have to make sure that they're, they're tightly controlled. There's a difference between walking to another building on our campus versus shipping items to Singapore. Arcturus made the vaccine and they sent that to us and we are the ones that tested whether those vaccine candidates work. Once you give a vaccine to a person or an animal, you will take their blood, then their serum, and you will test whether those antibodies are in there. So these are serum that the company has sent from mice that were given the vaccine. So they have vaccinated mice in the US, and they sent us the serum to test for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. They sent us down the vaccines as well. And we tried the vaccines in a different mouse model. So an animal model is what we generally do before we go into human trials. And that happens to fall under my domain in the lab. So in this case, we use mice. Mice don't get infected with COVID-19. They need a very particular type of receptor that can only be expressed in human lungs. So basically, the mice that we got are bioengineered mice that allows them to be infected with the virus. Every single lab in the world wanted their hands on these animals. These mice were expensive. This is a vaccine candidate from Arcturus. I'm preparing them now to deliver into the animals to test for the immune responses. So first things first, we would vaccinate the animals with different doses. And then daily, we would just monitor the animals and check their immune responses and whether there's any adverse effects of the vaccine on the animals. Obviously, if the vaccine candidate is not producing an immune response, if there are safety concerns in the animal stage, that'll halt your vaccine for sure. Usually, to get a vaccine from where we are at now, where we have an idea, a starting point, to the point of getting into human trials, is about three to five years, right? But this being an emergency, of course, we want to do this faster, somewhere between four to five months. And I think it can be done. When SARS broke in 2003, I had just joined the hospital. So when they identified this as a SARS coronavirus 2, <laughs> well, it felt like, um, you know, this is like SARS again, but with some real differences. I don't think anyone could have anticipated how quickly it has uh, affected, you know, the whole world. It was only in the first couple of weeks of March that we truly appreciated the devastating nature of this pandemic. It not only was a raging pandemic worldwide, it was also a raging financial and economic crisis. Nothing was this grave. The synchronized global lockdown was something that we had never seen. Singapore confirmed 23 new, case, new 142 cases of COVID-19 infections today. Most workplaces across Singapore have shut as the country begins what's being called a circuit breaker. So let me show you where our liquid nitrogen tank is. This is where we store our frozen cells that we use for our experiments. During the circuit breaker, we were told to go on split shifts, which is AM and PM. Usually, there's 16 of us in the lab, and whenever we're upset that we have the support, we complain a little bit. But when it became split shift, it was only essential people that were allowed to come back. So this is the biosafety cabinet. We do all our sterile work inside here. It got mentally draining because you then felt like you're fighting a battle on your own. It also got lonely because we are used to the lab being, being together. So 
So the research for the vaccine is actually being carried out at two different labs. Uh, one over there at uh, Duke NUS Medical School and over here in Academia Building where the Biomix lab is. During the circuit breaker period, because it's just yourself, sometimes you can be like rushing around doing 10 different things at a go. Experiments are such that we can't just put it aside and run off. I'm leaving a note for the next shift so that they know what to do. And that requires a lot of coordination between the AIM team and the PM team. We would leave messages on napkins, put it on boxes, as simple as please do not remove this. In terms of doing experiment laboratory work, this is very difficult. And because of COVID lockdown, flight schedules are a problem. Because air travel has decreased, it's taking longer and longer for us to get the things in. That's another very challenging thing that we've had. A lot of the filter tips and normal tips have been in short supply. We've even had to change the brand that we use because the tips have a backlog for about six months. A lot of countries have gone under lockdown, which meant that consumables, even as simple as pipette tips, factories were not producing it at the rate they were before. So this is the cold room where we keep some of our reagents that we use for the vaccine trial. This room is four degrees. So it's a room that's like a walk-in fridge. An assay is a test that we used to identify, for example, whether there is antibodies that uh, target the SARS-2 virus. Reagents that are specific to SARS-2, for example, for antibody detection, didn't even exist, right? This is a new pathogen. But as companies created these, there was a huge demand for these limited reagents. People started working on vaccines, right? Which means everyone's fighting for the same resources. So right now, we're ordering reagents, consumables, for the antibody assays that we're running. We're also trying to find replacement brands. One thing the pandemic did was it actually brought everyone together, our distributors and vendors. They knew of how urgent our work is and they will try their best to accelerate it and get it to us as soon as possible. Vaccines take a long time. <laughs> I, I cannot emphasize how long vaccines take. With how fast this virus is spreading, we cannot take 10 to 15 years to develop a vaccine. We need to do this much faster without sacrificing safety, without sacrificing the quality of the vaccine. We needed to shrink this 10 to 15 year process into literally a year or a year and a half. So everything happens sort of at the same time. As the situation gets worse across the world, a lot of the deadlines actually got pulled up. I think Inyong got <laughs> the most brunt of the deadlines. And he would come and he would whisper to me, I think it needs to be faster. <laughs> and I'll be like, there's nothing much I can do about it. There's obviously a pressure. Do this as fast as we can and be successful in what we're doing. The fortunate thing is that now we're in possession of a lot of technology that was not previously available we can still get that richness in data that would, in the past, would have required us years to collect. It's not so much a race with other competitors, but rather a race with the virus, right? Because the slower we are, the, the more the pandemic will cost society in terms of lives and the economy. So, of course, the team will have to pull uh, long hours, still to, you know, work weekends 24-7 sometimes, right? It's pretty late, sun is set. Very few people around. So now this is the last sample that I'm loading for um, this set of experiments. I'm Shu Wei, and my role in this vaccine trial is to study the T-cell responses towards this vaccine. It has been a bit of a rush to make sure that we get everything out in the quickest possible time. And so washing is complete, and now I can turn off the machine. During this period, I don't have a free second usually. The American company, they're based in California, they wake up when we go to sleep. Basically, as I come home around 10, 11, all the emails start coming in. We had one very long experiment that dragged on to very late at night. And so when I finally finished it, it was about 3 a.m. I'm just packing up for the day. 
I brought in a lot of snacks. I brought in like coffee to just keep myself mentally and physically awake cool throughout this long day. Yeah, there were so many long days, I've lost count. At the peak of the experiments, we would start at 4.30 a.m. in the morning, and we would end at 7 p.m. Grab a quick dinner, go home, and work on paperwork all the way, and then we restart again the next day. We are just coming in to check on some animals and some of the cell cultures in the lab. It's relatively quiet because it's a Sunday morning. Most of us will work on the weekends. The work is really exciting right now. There was one weekend when we were in the animal facility and it was the first clue that the vaccine was working in a live model. And for an hour, it was just me with the results and I was the only one who knew just how good the vaccine was. And I think that that sort of feeling sort of overwhelms all the other hard work that you had to put in, all the sacrifices you make on the weekends. And yeah, at the end of the day, it's worth it. But I, I wouldn't mind sleeping in once in a while. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. So the devastating impact of the global pandemic uh, affected some of the biggest drivers of global growth tremendously. There was no tourism, there was no travel, wide range of activities from hotels to airlines to restaurants and so on. That came to a standstill. The entire world was shutting down. So my husband's in Korea right now. He was also working on a COVID project there, a vaccine project, and I was getting involved with the vaccine project here. So we decided we will work on these. And once the board is open again, we'll meet up. But then as time went on and we realized this, there's no end to this, we were getting quite frustrated. Uh, him on his side, me on my side. Uh, we do a lot of uh, WhatsApp, Skyping, or he'll play piano and I'll listen to him while doing something else. I know he's trying his best, but it's not easy. Definitely not. Hello. Hello. I'm Sri Lankan. And in March, I had a flight ticket to go home. And because of the lockdown, my parents said, since I'm working on something very important, why don't you stay there? And for the first time, I can't fly home. It's actually scary. It's scary because I tell my parents, I'm like, please don't get sick because I can't come. I constantly have to tell them, hey, you know, wear a mask. Don't go out, especially my parents. Please don't go out. My grandmother is very, very old. My father is a heart patient and also has underlying asthma. So he's really at the highest risk to get COVID get sick with if he gets infected. We're actually smack in the middle. Obviously, I'm working on a vaccine for everyone's benefit. But I'm a bit selfish too. I'm working on it because I hope a vaccine comes out and my family can get it, my, my parents, my grandparents, um, my friends, and I can go home and see them. When I get tired, that's sort of what I think about. You know, this is, this is, this is why it's worth doing this. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care. Bye. Love you. Bye. A very good friend of mine, her father-in-law lives in New Jersey. So he got sick and he was on a ventilator for about a week. She messaged me that day to say that he, he passed on. It really hit home that this is a virus that kills. And then she said, you guys need to work much harder and much faster. And, and I thought, yeah, everything that we do, every day that we come in the grind, while it's very tiring, it makes a difference. Even if it saves one life, it makes a difference. This is the Anispot reader, and this tells us the T-cell response to the vaccine. The experiment is almost finished. 
and I can finally analyze the data and conclude this experiment. Arcturus actually gave us two different kinds of vaccines, and we didn't know how these will actually play out. Will they actually um, generate a good immune response, or will they just kind of sit there in the body and do nothing? So we actually saw very robust responses to one of the vaccine candidates. It was awesome. OK, so basically, each column represents a single animal. The results we see here is that we detect many spots on this plate, and each spot represents a T cell that is responding to the vaccine. This is a very robust T cell response, and this is very promising towards the development of a vaccine. Singapore's COVID-19 restrictions will be eased with the start of phase two. I'm Alec Cook. I'm a modeler here in the School of Public Health at NUS. I'm going to take you through to the outbreak room, usually for the outbreak team only, but I'll make an exception for you guys this time. Early on in the pandemic, my research team got repurposed to work on developing models that can help us understand how the COVID pandemic was going to play out. So this is one of the models that we developed early on in the pandemic. This shows you how many people in the population would be infected by the time we reach to June. So the basic reproduction number is one of the key quantities that we use to understand a novel outbreak. It tells us how transmissible a virus or bacteria will be. If the reproduction number is one, then you have one person infects, one person infects, one person. You never really have a big epidemic. If the reproduction number is two, one case could infect two people, who infect four people, who infect eight people, and so on, until a very large fraction of the population is infected. So if the reproduction number is below one, then the epidemic will die out by itself. At one extreme, you've got incredibly contagious viruses like measles. At the other extreme, you've got viruses which actually don't spread very easily, such as influenza, where the reproduction number is closer to one. For the SARS coronavirus, we think probably around about two or three, which actually is quite large. If you do absolutely nothing to try to control it, around about 80% of the population will be infected at the end of the first wave. For us to control the pandemic, we need to reduce the transmissibility by a half from two to one. And that means reducing our social contacts by a half or vaccinating half the population. So this is where the rest of the team are. So another thing that we're doing just now is looking at vaccines and how much we'd have to vaccinate in order to protect the population, to stop all the infections, to get rid of the guys in red. One concept which is very relevant in the context of vaccination is herd immunity. So what does that actually mean? Herd immunity is when you get protection from those around about you. You may not have been vaccinated, but if enough people around about you have been vaccinated and become immune that way, then you get protected because the virus cannot reach you. Now we know that some people who get vaccinated don't get the response they need. So the ones in black received the vaccine and got protected. The ones in grey got the vaccine, but the vaccine didn't work for them. The ones in green would be protected from those around the bottom. So if the vaccine efficacy is 70%, in order to make sure that there's only black, grey and green, and there's no red here, then we would need to vaccinate somewhere around about 80% of the population in order to reach herd immunity through vaccination. Entering into a BSL3 facility, which is a high containment facility for infectious diseases. BSL3 stands for Biosafety Laboratory 3. In the BSL3 facility, the pathogens there are potentially life threatening and we do not want them getting out. So, if you look to the right over here, this is a gazetted area. It's a protected place and only for authorized personnel because this is where we house the live virus for the COVID 19. This is a CCTV camera that looks at everything that's happening in this facility. You see every single lab, you can see what everyone is doing and who is in the facility. So now that we know there's an immune response in the animals, we now need to go and check whether the immune response is protective. So we will go in to infect these animals with a live SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is called a challenge trial. 
So a lot of things happen in the BSL-3 is actually quite exciting. This is where we infect the animals that have been vaccinated with the live virus. So this is Benson. He's our facility manager. He runs the entire facility here. Nobody gets in or out without him. So this is what we call a PAPR, which is a powered air purifying respirator. Each of us wears this in the lab, and this clips onto our system about here. And as you can see, it bubbles up, and it keeps us breathing filtered air all the time in the labs to ensure that we don't get exposed to anything. So beyond this door, you can't come in with us anymore because it's a containment corridor. And right past these doors is where we house all the live viruses. So this is access control, and only researchers are allowed to go past here. In a usual vaccine development process, you would have all your animal data ready, packed up, before you go into a phase one human clinical trial. Right now, in Singapore, we hope to start human clinical trials alongside the efficacy testing in the animals. Any clinical trial in Singapore needs two things, right? You need to convince the HSA, the Health Sciences Authority, that you have done all the necessary studies to show that the vaccine is safe and that it has a chance of working. And then we need to go and apply to the ethics board where they will then review the ethics of the clinical trial. What I'm doing right now is uh, trying to um, collate this immunogenicity information, right? I'm working through the weekend. A lot of us are working through the weekend, trying to get this data analyzed, graphed, summarized, and sent to Arcturus so they can update HSA. You can see here, actually, when we give the mice just saline solution, there's no response. But when we give the vaccine, so the red lines are the vaccine responses, beautiful antibody responses. These antibodies that are produced by the vaccine are also protect, so it can block infection. So we have to make sure that we cross all the hurdles of safety, the likelihood that this thing is, will work, and that is done ethically. I don't foresee any major setback from the regulatory submission because the data has been very good. I think there was a sense of urgency. Um, we were behind the other vaccines that were being produced in um, the States and in Oxford. I think the speed at which we've been able to work has really surprised everybody, even those of us who are working on it every day. We've just had the first publication of a clinical trial um, coming out of our UK vaccine trials, phase one study. There are two important findings. One is that the safety profile of the vaccine looks very reassuring, which is good news. And secondly, the immune responses that we have seen, particularly with two doses of the vaccine, are very good indeed. In order to make this assessment of how well does the vaccine work, and we need quite large numbers in the clinical trials, so here in the UK, we are rapidly moving towards more than 8,000 people vaccinated. We're working with our colleagues in South Africa and Brazil, and over the next month or so, about another seven or 8,000 people will be vaccinated in those settings as well. If we can get an effective vaccine, that will allow people to get back to normal life, hopefully, after they are vaccinated, so that people come out of lockdown and economic activity can be restored back to, hopefully, near normal levels. So it looks like we just received news that uh, we got the approval from HSA to start phase one and two trials. Uh, I think we're on our way. Hopefully we can start this uh, next week or so. Just gonna catch up with Esther Gunn. So no, no clinical signs of. No, no clinical disease. signs, nothing. Yeah, you know, this, this is great. I mean, this means that the vaccine works to protect 100% of the vaccinated animals uh, from lethal infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2. I don't think it matters at the end of the day that we are a few steps behind, as long as this is a product that would give ideally the best chance of long-term immunity. Everything is pointing towards this being a, a, a good vaccine, potentially a chance for a one-dose vaccine. 
obviously this is still in an animal, whether it works in humans in the same way, we, we don't know. But if it's successful, then we have a vaccine. If not, then we don't. Hi, I'm Dr. Jenny Lo. I'm the principal clinical trial investigator for the Luna Cov 19 vaccine in Singapore. Okay, subjects will be registered at the reception. We'll fill up the health declaration form. We have just gotten the approval from Health Science Authority Singapore and our ethics body. So this meeting now is to discuss the logistics to start the trial. So the phase one and two trials basically ask primarily is the vaccine safe? And then does it generate the immune responses in a sizable population, usually in hundreds? The phase three trial, you now need to vaccinate tens of thousands of people, where you compare the vaccine with another group that got placebo and ask whether the group that got the vaccine has reduced rates of disease. Because we are now in a pandemic environment and time is of essence, we are combining phase one and two together. By doing so, there's no pause in between and that potentially would have saved us several months of work. We are looking to recruit about 100 uh, healthy volunteers ages 21 to 80 years of age. In one room, we'll have two subjects each, so the safe distancing can be maintained. This trial is unique because of COVID-19 pandemic situation. We need to put in additional social distancing measures. Logistics is also more challenging in terms of planning the timeline. I think for safety, probably 15 minutes between each dose. Yeah, yeah great. We will start at 10 and every subject, there will be a 15 minutes interval. Okay, yeah, we will take note of that. Yeah. Okay, then we're all ready. So right now, what we're doing is really getting ready for phase one. We just want to double check everything is good to go for next week. When we heard that we got the green line for phase one, we were actually quite excited. Everyone was excited. We've been walking since March. A lot of us have gotten very little sleep. We're still getting very little sleep, but it was actually quite exciting. Phase one, two trial is about to start. Right now, it's somewhat calm, but very soon we're going to start getting hundreds of samples coming through. Today is screening day, so I'm going to brief the first batch of volunteers that have come in. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Jenny Lo. I'm the principal investigator for this trial that uh, you're here for screening today. This vaccine is a new vaccine, which means that it has never been tested in humans before. After you have read through the consent form, you will be given time to think through whether you want to take part in the study. In reality, the scientists working in the space of emerging infectious diseases are constantly aware and worried over the next outbreak you know, or the next pandemic. We have been partnering with uh, Duke NUS Medical School to accelerate this clinical trial process. We have been practicing for such a scenario. So Susan, everything is looking good. Now my coordinator will bring you next door to finish the rest of the health screening. Alright. On retrospect, we are glad that we have done those practice rounds. Now we are mentally and in many ways are physically ready for it as well. Once you have decided to take part in the study, we will then proceed to do a physical health check on you before you are allowed uh, to be enrolled into the trial. We're all very excited. The team has been working very, very hard to get the trial up and ready to this stage. We've screened quite a number of volunteers and we can start vaccination of the first batch of volunteers next week. Naturally, there's a little bit of trepidation but we are confident that we have uh, put in stringent procedures, checks, and that the trial will proceed smoothly. The pace with which vaccines are being developed is unprecedented, but so is the problem. You've got essentially the, the worst disease outbreak for over 100 years. 
We have new vaccine technologies. We have very high financial investment and an unprecedented scientific collaboration. So for this phase one clinical trial, the doses will be tested in ascending doses. So for example, we will start with a very, very small dose um, at one microgram as a single dose. And once we are assured that there's no safety concern, then we will move on to the next concentration. And for the phase one trial, we will go up to 10 microgram. We will then select the best dose based on safety profile and also the immune response that we see in these subjects. For all phase one and phase two vaccine clinical trial, safety is the main endpoint that we are evaluating. Good morning, Susan. How are you? Good. If uh, all is well, then we'll proceed with the dosing today. Okay. Very mild side effects are very common from any medicinal products or vaccines. That's actually the body's immune response to the vaccine. If any subjects were to develop any symptoms that are of concern to the subject's health and long-term outcome, we will have to halt the study and evaluate. We are all trying to complete phase one and two, start phase three as soon as possible. There are several vaccines now in uh, uh, phase three trials. AstraZeneca, collaboration with Oxford University, uh, Moderna, uh, Pfizer, in collaboration with uh, BioNTech. You know, the Chinese have a couple of vaccine companies that are also in late phase clinical trials. Vaksinnya jam 9, berangkat di sini jam 8 lebih lah. Biar nyantai ke sananya. Deg-degan juga sih mau divaksin. Gimana rasanya? Nama saya ya Supriyatna, umur 42 tahun untuk sekarang. Saya dulu pernah bekerja jadi security beberapa tahun. Nampaknya ya kena dampak ke corona ini kena pengurangan inilah pengurangan karyawan. Iya. Saya waktu ini diajakin sama adik ipar, katanya, "A, mau ikutan enggak jadi relawan vaksin?" Ya, boleh-boleh aja lah kata saya gitu. Saya dan istri senang ikut vaksin ini. Semoga lancar terus vaksinnya emang berjalan untuk saya buat masyarakat luas nantinya. Dan negara-negara yang lain juga mungkin. Bio Farma ini adalah sebagai BUMN yang 100% milik negara atau milik pemerintah. Yang sedang kita lakukan sekarang di Bio Farma, kita melakukan uji klinis fase 3 yang berasal calon vaksinnya itu berasal dari Sinovac eh, Tiongkok. Yang sekarang dilakukan, yakni di, di samping di Indonesia dilakukan di Brazil di Bangladesh, di Chile, kemudian di Turki. You have countries who need vaccines urgently, hosting companies that have produced vaccines. They have these numbers that is required for trials, especially phase three efficacy trials. And this is why not just Sinovac, but others as well, Americans, British, German, they are also looking at working with these countries. And the vaccines, once tested, once approved, will be made available in sufficient magnitude to this population. So the country that hosts these trials obviously will accrue benefits from it. Hari ini saya akan melaksanakan COVID pertama. Rasanya sih agak deg-degan juga sedikit, tapi ya semoga nggak apa-apa. Semoga lancar-lancar aja. I think at the back of everyone's mind is whether or not a country will try establishing some kind of quid pro quo. You know, they provide vaccines, try to get something else. We don't know for sure until we see things materialize. China is also very cognizant of the fact that their leader, uh, President Xi Jinping, stated very clearly that as far as China is concerned, the vaccine that they produce is going to be a global public good. <laughs> Thank you.
it should be by virtue of being a public good uh, accessible uh, to everyone. Saya sesudah vaksin disuruh menunggu 30 menit. Kalau ada reaksi, reaksinya kayak pegal-pegal, lemes dan sebagainya itu. Saya tidak ada reaksinya. Sekarang pulang mau Jumatan dulu. Target kita memang 250 juta dosis per tahun uh, untuk COVID-19 ya. Karena ini pandemi ya, ininya beda dengan uh, vaksin yang normal ya. Kalau kita mau ekspor juga tapi harus didahulukan yang dalam negeri. Kita harus mendahulukan kebutuhan untuk uh, bangsa kita dulu. Good morning, Susan. Morning. How are you feeling today? Good. The volunteers have to come back for a total of eight visits. And every time they come back for the visits, we will take blood samples from them. It can be quite a sacrifice on the volunteers. So we are very appreciative for all the volunteers that have stepped forward. Actually, for this trial, the response from the volunteers have been rather overwhelming and positive. Everybody wants to try to play a part in this fight against COVID-19. We got a lot of uh, phone calls and email requests from people around the region. Unfortunately, because the borders are closed, we ended up having to turn down many of their requests. We've just collected the blood samples from our volunteer. So after this, these tubes here will be sent for processing. Then it will be analysed. As a clinician scientist, naturally, I am very, very curious to find out the results of the trial, but uh, we will have to wait until the trial is complete. There is always a possibility that this simply may not work in humans. We would certainly be disappointed, but ultimately this is a very inevitable part of clinical trials where things may fail and they can and do fail actually. We definitely hope that the vaccine that we are working on is going to be one of the contenders. Hopefully, by doing that, you know, we can show the world that Singapore also has the capability to conduct this type of research and development on vaccines and therapeutics in Singapore. The first batch of human samples have come into the lab. There will be no such thing as a vaccine with no side effects. Increasingly, there's a group of what we call the anti-vaxxers. You may have to censor me because I really hate anti-vaxxers. The question is, if we have already licensed vaccines like Pfizer's and Moderna's, why do we need to continue with this development? Yeah.